Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Paul, for that great introduction. And it does seem like a long time ago since Berlin in 1994. Anyone else who was there at that time? <laughs> yeah, probably not. No, it's been a long while. Uh, <laughs> um, I suppose my interest in Paralympic sport, it maybe you could say it was fairly selfish, having had a spinal injury myself playing rugby. And uh, uh, as a physician, I sort of got into uh, Paralympic sport, thinking uh, in those early days, what is, what, what's the knowledge that's available that can help me as a team physician in delivering better health care for my athletes? And it was fairly sparse, so it was kind of out of a need for improving the health care of my athletes that I started to get into, uh, interested in uh, uh, further research in this area. Um, and as uh, people have said, it was 2002, uh, as uh, my first time with the IPC Medical Committee, uh, delivering the first injury survey at the Salt Lake Games, and that was me, and engaging the, uh, the uh, medical officer from the, from the polyclinic to help me, Stuart Willick. Um, we tried that again in Athens, on me and my own, and it was a, a, a task that I couldn't manage. Um, but now we have a whole team of people around us, and I think if I'm proud of one thing, it's that now injury and illness and veilers is embedded within the IPC as something ongoing, at games that we need to improve the health of our athletes and protect them and improve the management of injuries and illness and only through surveillance and, and looking at that can we do that so let me just uh, start off with an example the third person going down there was Sherry Blower who is our chair now and you can see also how not to react in certain situations, um, not to run onto the track <laughs> um, without looking what's happening, um, how not to yank up athletes who've just fallen over by their shoulders and, and so on. So in improving and educating, learning from the, these events that occur, it's an ongoing process that we must engage in. Some of you may have already seen this publication which looked at the epidemiology of injuries at the London 2012 Games. Um, and that was the first real summer uh, uh, Paralympic Games injury and illness survey. And that documented over 633 injuries and 539 athletes. And we published that, but that's the broad overview. What we need to do as we move forward is to get down into the nitty-gritty of sport specificity. And if we look at the, uh, the, uh, oh, sorry. Get the hang of this soon. This is the average. When you look at the average, the, the you can always hear about the man who died in a river whose average depth was six foot. Um, so the mean only tells you a certain amount of information. We yet didn't need to get into the nitty-gritty. And one of the things that struck me was what's the, uh, the sport with the highest uh, number of uh, injuries, and that was football five-a-side. But athletics actually comes fairly high up. But as we know, athletics is not really one sport. It's, it's lots of different sports, particularly with the wheelchair element adding into it, it makes it very different to able-bodied athletics. There's so many different facets to athletics, which means you need to dive into the detail to understand what does that bar really mean in terms of our understanding and improving our knowledge. And as we go back in the literature, we look at the, this concept of the wheelchair athlete as something that comes up over and over again. And it's something that uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with. We could see here David Weir is obviously an athlete and is obviously in a wheelchair. But there are many aspects of things in sports. For just an example, in athletics, where we have a field event where the person is in a wheelchair for his daily activity but transfers to a seated frame to participate in uh, his event. So is that a wheelchair athlete or someone who uses a wheelchair but doesn't use a chair for his particular event? So it's a bit confusing, this term. And a lot of the early studies use this generic term of wheelchair athlete, which caused confusion, really, in our understanding of the issues around injuries to athletes. But it did raise the issue that it suspected that wheelchair uh, uh, athletes and racers had a high incidence of injury. So what I'm going to do over this period is talk about 
uh, a little bit about the sub-analysis of the data from London 2012 and, and see what that shakes out. And actually, um, in the next few weeks, you should be able to download the uh, publication, which has been uh, accepted by the American Journal of Sports Medicine, um, and we'll hopefully you'll be able to see that fairly soon and read the, uh, the full text of the, uh, uh, the data that we uh, analyzed. So what I'm going to present today is this sub-analysis of the London uh, injury surveillance in relation to athletics and to try and characterize the proportion of incidents of injury and look at are there any messages there that we can see that we can use in terms of prevention in the future. We had 977 athletes participating in the sport of athletics and we monitored um, them over the 10 day periods of the games. Clearly we need to define injuries, uh, uh, what we're going to use, and this is one of the issues in many studies. And since uh, um, 2010 we've used this, uh, these uh, injury definitions. An injury being any newly acquired injury as well as exacerbations of pre-existing injury that occurred during training and or competition or the competition period of the London 2012 Paralympic Games. And we define the acute traumatic, acute on chronic and chronic overuse injury specifically so we can subclassify those. Now we collected data in two main forms and firstly I need to thank all of the team physicians and physiotherapists who contributed to that because without your input this data is much less meaningful and it's really really important that when we come to Rio next year that you help us again in this data collection because we have the data which we get from the venue medical officer, from the, uh, from the polyclinic, things that happen which are governed by the uh, organizing committee, but very, really, really important is the data that is submitted by you, the team physicians and physiotherapists, on a daily basis to tell us about new injuries that occur within your teams. And uh, with my colleague, Professor Wayne Derman, who is res really responsible with his, his colleague, Martin Schvelnus, at, uh, in, uh, then at Cape Town, developed this online system where, we, where you could put in the information each day about new injuries and illnesses. And it's brilliant that it only takes a few minutes to do, and, and it's, it's, if you can spare us that time moving forward, it will continue to improve the quality of data that we collect at these surveys. So from that, we can then determine the incidence rate because the, uh, within the online system that you talk about, that you will put in, the chief medical officer will input the number of athletes within the village who are training or competing on any specific day. So we can then calculate the number of injuries per thousand athlete days, uh, the injury incidence rate, and that enables us then to compare equally uh, of cr across events of different duration, and it gives us that, with that exposure data, it gives us that very helpful um, uh, injury incidence rate. And we also look at the incident, injury incidence proportion, and that's the number of injuries per 100 athletes. And there are another, a number of other variables which we can see, anatomical location, timing in relation to training or competition, the severity of injury, and, and so on, by time loss. And I'm going to talk about some of these, only some of these data, but they are available in the full paper as that becomes available. So if we look at the results, there were 216 injuries reported in the sport of athletics during London 2012. Uh, and that was in 977 uh, athletes, which give us an instance proportion of 18.4 injuries per 100 athletes. So one in five of your athletes approximately are going to be injured during a, an event like this. And it gives us a, uh, um, the incidence rate, 22.1 uh, injuries per thousand athlete days. And you can see there's a slight difference between the, uh, the track and the field, uh, but not marked. So we look at field events, first of all. It's useful here. This compares, look, we can see that there's no significant uh, gender difference. Um, there's no significant difference of number of injuries by age. And if we look at the uh, ambulance throwing events, we can see that uh, uh, the CP throwers had a slightly reduced number of uh, uh, injuries uh, compared to the others. If we look at the track athletes, we see that there is a significant difference between the number of the injury rate between uh, males and females, so significantly higher in males. And um, also the ambulance CP athletes had a lower injury of uh, 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 incidence in, in, in the track. 
and wheelchair racing even lower, and I'm going to come back to that in a, in a short while. So let's go into that then. The instance rate of injuries by impairment in track athletics. So we can see that actually wheelchair racing has the lowest incidence of injury amongst all those, which may be counterintuitive for some people who previously thought that wheelchair racing was uh, um, a, a high cause of problems. In so if we take our overall data from London 2012, and we've got the mean on the left-hand side in the blue column, um, and then we take wheelchair track as an individual sport, we can actually start to place that in terms of injury risk, um, you know, in proportion to the remainder of the IPC sports. So that's why taking these means and just having a broad brush a look at it is not really helpful in terms of where we need to target um, maybe um, our attention for injury prevention strategies. So we look at the sport with the highest number of, or the highest instance rate, we see the ambulant amputee athlete. So we need to think about why that may be. Is, is it related to the sport or could there be possibly non-sport factors that may influence this? So I think because of that, we need to reflect on a few other things. So this was a paper by, by Brendan Burkett looking at the number of steps that people take in their average day when they're training at home or when they're training at a major championships, which is sports specific, such as the event here. So with the event here, the athletes will go from the hotel, they'll be transported to the track, they'll get out, they'll do the competition, they go home. In a Paralympic Games environment, we have a village, we have a distance to the dining hall and back again, we have a distance to the transportation mall and back again. And so actually the number of steps that people take during a Paralympic Games is very different. And Burkett's study found that there was an 83% increase over a normal day for athletes in terms of number of steps. So if you take that increased loading of walking, an 83% increase, increase in walking, and add that onto your, the, the loading of sport, there's possible reasons why there may be more problems in ambulant amputee athletes. Here's a... Uh, a residual limb developing an infection and so the constant chafing just of walking may lead on to problems so we need to be very good at talking to our athletes about hygiene and prosthetic fit about the good practices of main maintaining minimizing skin breakdown how we monitor it and this is something which is maybe not all athletes are particularly good at doing and as the medical staff we need to be really good at reinforcing that and it's also important that we um, have these good relationships with the, the prosthetic repair services so that athletes can get early attention to, to these issues to try and prevent uh, progression of injuries and, uh, through the residual limb. So we look at injuries in wheelchair athletes by event type. What we notice from this is that uh, in terms of the uh, acute traumatic injuries, we can see the highest uh, uh, incidence is in the uh, throwing athlete. Here we've got acute traumatic injuries in sprint 6, 4, 18. And also that's important in terms of the impact on days lost from training or competition. So a much higher incidence in this uh, group. So throwing events seem to have a high incidence of injury and they seem to cause more time loss. So we put those athletes in there now, we, we put the bar in, we can actually see that the, the wheelchair field event athletes plotted separately have a higher uh, uh, incidence of injury even compared to the football five that we were originally concerned about as the highest risk sport. If we look at the top five injuries by anatomical region in wheelchair athletes. We see the shoulder and elbow is coming up. And what it's clear is that this is a problem of the throwing athlete. And this is something we're aware of in able-bodied sports, that the overhead activity of throwing, whether you look at tennis or uh, volleyball or any throwing of the javelin, it's this overhead activity which is produces the shoulder in the position of risk. That the pushing of the chair itself 
seems to be less uh, uh, of a cause of a problem. But it's the overhead activity combined with pushing the chair and day-to-day -day activity which seems to be the main risk factor. And as Peter alluded to earlier, we need to think about the consequences of these injuries on athletes' future health, um, how they can pr continue with propulsion from transfer, from chair to, 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 to bed, to toilet, to the car, how they manage self-care, driving, and so on. So the impact of a, uh, uh, um, a shoulder injury to the wheelchair athlete can have significantly greater impact. If we now go and have a look at the anatomic region of injury in the ambulatory athletes, what we see is that the thigh, the hamstring, the quadriceps, the muscle injuries uh, in the running athlete, um, as you would see in able-bodied athletics, is the most common site uh, of injury in track athletics. So the thigh, the knee, the low back, lower leg, foot and ankle. So from the back downwards, as, as your similar patterns as we see in, in, in track athletics which is reassuring in some respects. So what do we take home from that? For some of the things that we've seen, the age itself does not predict injury. There does not appear to be any greater instance of injury with our older athletes, and para-athletics does have more old, older athletes than able-bodied athletics. That the ambulance CP track athletes experience lower incidence of injury compared to others, and we need to th reflect on that and think about why that may be that wheelchair-seated athletes are at higher risk of shoulder injury in field events compared to wheelchair racing. So maybe we need to think about training practices, maintenance, uh, how, how, how the shoulder is, is trained. The ambulance athletes experience a high sense of injury to the thigh, presumptly observed in track athletes. So we need to think about our hamstring uh, training protocols uh, and, and rehabilitation protocols. As you know, that uh, the highest predictor of a hamstring injury is a previous hamstring injury. So we need to think about how we, we rehabilitate these athletes and are we doing it most effectively. And the wheelchair-seated uh, athlete experience the highest sense of injury to the shoulder and clavicle, pre uh, predominantly in the field athletes. So as I said, we are going to continue the surveillance program going on into uh, Rio 2016. As I say, it is part of the embedded IPC policy for injury and illness surveillance. But the program is run by uh, the medical committee and volunteers at the games and the work that you do. And so uh, you know, this is not a, a very highly funded program. It, it does take us a while, as I say, to, to do the analysis. We are all um, you know, individual practitioners who try and then work together internationally to bring together these publications to you. But without your input going forward in helping put this data in, um, we wouldn't have this uh, data to present to you. So I really do thank you for that and would encourage you to help us going forward. But I also think there's a role for athletics itself to take on the mantle of doing longitudinal studies within your sport to get much better data. Because these games... Uh, data is snapshots of time rather than longitudinal. So I think, you know, if you as major nations can get together, group together, and start to develop policies of sharing anonymized data, looking at the injury risk over a longer period of time, this will have a much better impact on term really understanding the causes and if there are successful strategies for injury and illness prevention. But I want to, to recognize my colleagues and thank them for all their work and to thank you for your attention. And I'm sorry that you'll have to listen to me a couple of times more later today. I hope you won't be bored with my voice by the end. But thank you very much. Thank you.